Lewis, and this is Chris, and we're going to talk to you about uh, monads and comprehending over them. Um, I'm going to come back in later, but for now I'm actually going to hand off to other Chris. Right, hi. So, direct style monad comprehensions, or how I like to call it, monadic superpowers through less syntax. So that's the thing we all know, the for comprehension has a for keyword and a yield, and, and it's very specialized syntax for working with monads. It's, can be easier than the maps and flat maps, right? Let's look at this. So T could be, so let's say task, it's one of the monads, and you get the value V out of T1, and then you do something with the value. So they are, they are specialized. But what if we could get away without having specialized syntax? Just use the syntax we already have, everything else in Scala. Um, so we're proposing an alternative, which is direct style syntax, which looks like this. Um, and it's similar to some things you may have known or seen. So maybe some things you just saw. Yeah, dot value. So we, we have a method on monad types uh, or on the companion. So task task is the monad we're working with here. So task dot flat allows us to open a scope. And within the scope, you have monadic superpowers. And what you can do with that is one is you can get values out of the monad. So you can call something that's equivalent to the dot get on option only that it doesn't throw an exception, but it's allowed because the scope surrounding it kind of puts it back into the monad. So inside of it, you're allowed to do that, but then it's wrapped up again. And uh, we use the word flat because, well, we could have called monadic or something, but ideally you want it to be used by people who don't really know what a monad is. Then flat is kind of more familiar. That value is also familiar from SPT. Maybe we come up with a shorter name. It's kind of a bit long. And uh, well, task needs to kind of be there because it needs, uh, Scala needs it for the type inference. That's at least in our implementation. All right, uh, well, better ideas welcome, of course. So let's look at some examples why this may actually be, be a good idea to do. So this is some uh, blocking code, some non-monadic code. We have a class person, a class address. We have a database access layer, which has a method person by ID, address by ID, gets a person in a blocking way, gets an address in a blocking way, some sample data on the right here. Um, here's an example use, so print ln show person one, so it gets the person one down here. Um, and show person actually, well, it does some timing, so it first gets the time now, and then it does a database call to get the person in a blocking way. It calls the logger to say, hey, I did something. Then it produces, or it computes a value result, which is the name of that person, and appended is a string if the person is rich, then we print is rich and lives in, and then we fetch the address from the database. And finally, we're done, and we say, oh, stats.write, like, let's record how, how long it took, and return the result. OK, so what if we want to turn that into asynchronous? Um, so I switch to the other file, so everything is prepared for asynchronous now. We import task, our database access uh, layer returns tasks, the show person returns tasks, but this is still blocking, so we need to rewrite it in a way that it actually works now. So what do we have to do for that? OK, let's do the four comprehensions. Um, Right, so we move all of this stuff in here, and we probably yield the result down there. And for the person, we need to get it out of the task with the arrow for the logger. That, let's say that's a blocking operation still, so we just do underscore equals. Um, for result, we probably, uh, so we, val can't be used inside of four comprehensions. And this, so wait, this is a monad, so we need to kind of pull this out, dot map, and then this needs to be, in the other branch needs to be a monad as well, so task dot now, which wraps it into the default thing, and then this whole thing is a monad again, so we kind of need to take that away, do dot map, okay, oh, and here's stats dot right, we need to do this as well, so that, let's say this is non-blocking as well, so this should be the kind of rewritings we have to do if we change our minds on being blocking. Now we're non blocking. Okay. Let's look error. at. Sorry? You missed an error. I Result. missed. Um, oh, oh, you're right. That's it. So this was quite a bit of rewriting. Let's see how it would look like with the dot flat syntax. So, same thing. It's, it's back. We're back to the, it's the next file. We're back to the original blocking. Uh, syntax in here. Um, stuff is already prepared for task, but we're back to the val equals and all that. So 
now, first of all, what we have to do is we have to do fl uh, task dot flat. So now we have monadic superpowers in the scope, so we can just say dot value on the monad here and dot value on the monad here. And uh, that should be it because flat understands this if else and generates the two branches. Flat understands that in this statement position, there's an expression of the monad type, so it will kind of chain it into the monad and run it as a side effect in the right place. And that's it. And the way you get flat onto your custom monad is by just doing this, where you just make an extension method on the companion object of your monad and say, hey, there's flat define and it's this. Right, so it works. Uh, let's say the flat comprehension. There we go. All right, and I'm handing uh, back to Chris. Okay, so what I'm going to do is actually, so you've seen like basically our library as it exists now, this thing is in heavy development at this point. Um, if you're adventurous, we are publishing builds. But um, anyway, what I'm gonna do is take a step way, way, way back from what Chris just showed and try to put this in a bit of context. So I'm gonna go all the way back to the mission of type level. So according to type level, type level is about letting the Scala compiler work for you. And yes, 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 I cannot agree with this more. And, but what does that actually mean in practice? Well, basically type level projects in general are about trying to profit from the fact that Scala is a statically typed language. Basically, uh, things that, basically letting, the, letting things like cogeneration and inspection happen because we are statically typed and providing better guarantees and all that sort of great stuff. Um, we are definitely something in that category. We are, we are a library basically allowing you to profit from types. So basically what, what working in comprehensions does is it allows you to take context, something which is normally implicit when you're writing something like blocking code, and make it an explicit, reified, known and named thing. Basically literally factoring it out and letting someone else handle it. That's what comprehensions are about. And you actually see this technique used in a lot of great and really powerful libraries. Um, and ba so basically, some capabilities that we get are what you just saw, the capability to basically take what looks like blocking code, but um, insert basically uh, yields where, where, wherever you need a value and transform that blocking code into non-blocking code without changing its form, which is amazing. Uh, we also, because we can work on the context itself, that is to say that we can combine these things without extracting them from the context and thereby assert independence of values, we can run these things in parallel. So you can take two tasks and non-determinism and say, basically, I want to run these two tasks in parallel. I don't, they, there, there can be no dependency between them because they don't have their values at the same time. Great, parallelism. Uh, Libraries like Duby um, basically use Clisely to do dependency injection as part of the context and thereby factor it out. Um, there's some great libraries like Slick and Clump um, that can perform optimizations on your code or your SQL queries um, because you're working in a context. And um, there's some really great capabilities that you get by the fact that monads basically allow you to pass data along through your computations without seeing it as part of the context. And basically, these capabilities are tremendously powerful. Like, we all know that they're really powerful, but I just want to highlight the fact that, like, these are things that everybody should be taking advantage of, like, everywhere. Not, not just us, but, like, everybody. Um, so anyway, I've actually, like, tried, like, the use contexts pervasively throughout your application. There are actually a lot of problems with it. Basically, you end up working inside of fours, like, all over the place. Most of your methods end up being dominated by a for comprehension. Like, okay, so actually the way that the Scala blocking structure works, you often have to assign some vowels before the for comprehension, but almost everything goes inside of a for. And the problem with this is that the code that you write inside of a for comprehension actually like isn't Scala code. It has all of these fundamental like structural limitations. Um, you saw it some with what Chris was, was writing. Like whenever you want to conditionally execute some piece of code, you have to pull things out to the top level and restructure your code. Like basically when, when there's some effect that you only want to run some of the time, um, it gets really ugly. And the worst part of this is like trying to justify this to the rest of your team. Like why should they have to structure their code in terms of your four comprehensions? Like 
bas basically, um, like, I, I worked with a team of people who, who are willing to put up with my, with my shenanigans. But um, at the end of the day, like, I, I, I have to show them some benefit for all these hoops that they're jumping through, or else make them jump through fewer hoops. Yeah, so at the end of the day, what is it that we actually want to do? Like, our, the work that we're doing is basically designed to take blocking code and, and turn it into non-blocking code, which basically means making it as, e as easy to write non-blocking code as blocking code, making it practical to use contexts wherever it makes sense. So, like, things like Doobie um, should, like, to make a tremendous amount of sense for managing database transactions, like, there should be no practical barrier to working like, like that. Um, and anyway, uh, so what are we actually doing, like, code-wise? So there's something about, like, soundness versus completeness. Basically, the macros that we have now rewrite code in a, in a sound way, but because of the intricacies of like symbols and owners and stuff in the compiler, you end up with things that you write that should type check and they don't. Um, you get com you get weird compiler errors that that are like, oh, uh, th th this this tree went to the typer and it didn't make sense. And so ba 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 basically, like you get errors where you're you don't get it. Nothing gets through that shouldn't get through, but we need to work a little bit on like making sure that anything that should get through does, uh, if that makes sense. Um, we want to support more of the language. Um, also, uh, right now, uh, we don't actually have explicit support for nesting uh, comprehensions, and that should be possible. Also, comprehensions that work on multiple monads, sort of like M style, like you should be able to work on an entire stack all at once. We don't have any support for that now. Um, also, both of us have this history with the ill-fated Scala compre Comprehensive Comprehensions project, where basically you can perform uh, contextual transformations on the entire monad, uh, monadic context from inside of it, letting you do things like express a sort partway through a comprehension over a list, which is really powerful. Um, and we want to be able to integrate some of the features from that into this work. Um, OK, so you guys might be wondering, like, aren't, why, why, why are you guys writing a library? Like, aren't there some other things that, that, that are similar to this already in existence? Um, well, yeah, so the first one that comes to mind, first ones that come to mind are SPT's value, which everyone will bring up, but, real, but everyone pretty much realizes is restricted to SPT itself. Also, if you actually look into it, SPT's value isn't this kind of transformation because SPT's value is actually about applicative uh, comprehensions. Basically, if you express any dependency on something, then that thing will be evaluated before any of your code. And it doesn't even matter whether it's inside of a conditional, it just will always evaluate that task before uh, your code, and it'll evaluate all of them. Uh, Scala Async is an, actually an extremely similar project. It does a lot of the same things, except it has this one limitation, which is that it's restricted to just working on Scala futures. Um, and so that's not good. Um, Effectful is a library that exists. It's probably the closest to what we do. And in some ways, it's more full featured. But the problem with it is that it, it sort of trusts the things like untype check a bit too much. They, they don't actually quite work. Like, we've had to fall back to typed macros for a lot of our stuff. Um, anyway, uh, there are some other libraries also sort of in this space. Anyway, uh, so that's it. Uh, and uh, both of our companies are hiring. So if you are in the Bay Area or New York or interested in moving to those places, then talk to us. And questions. <laughs>when you're doing monadic pro programming one of the things that's an irritation as as you demonstrated is is conditional so you you end up writing if m or something like that to to abstract that away um, another thing you run into a lot is traversing uh, traversing collections so if if for example you have list.map something dot value right you need a, a traversable functor instance for list to to make that make sense do you have you guys done any work in that direction or does it, I mean, what does your thing do? Does it so, handle so, that or blow up or what? So it, right now, it wouldn't handle that. Like, it wouldn't, it would just tell you, 
that your it would reject your code. Um, it, it just says I can't I right. can't transform this into right. You know. But um, you're right. Like actually, a traverse instance is exactly the thing you need to be able to at least in certain principled cases, be able to work inside of uh, deferred contexts. So really what it comes down to is in the general case, you're not able to, to perform this kind of a transformation when you cross the boundary into some sort of a context where uh, the, the evaluation is deferred. There are some limited cases where you can, like, um, and generally the like map and flat map are predictable enough that you can actually basically rewrite um, extractions inside of the body of someone else's map or flat map as long as the requ uh, requisite traverse instances exist. Um, in general, our library right now, we try to do things in terms of pure syntax. Unfortunately, like there just isn't enough uniformity to write a pure syntax traverse equivalent. Like, So we're probably going to have to actually use some sort of a type classy approach to, to actually doing that, something that we've been putting off. Um, but at some point, yes, that will definitely be what our approach has to look like because it's the only way. Okay, and I, I guess I had a second part to that. Um, in in if you've got a, an expression like um, a dot value plus b dot value times c dot value, you have an operator precedence issue. Which how do you how do you figure out the order of the effects of those monads um, in an expression like that? Is it just right to left, or does it follow the precedence rules of evaluation, or what? Because it's in a macro, it actually happens after the thing has been parsed. So it's, it's, it's just going to follow operator precedence. So uh, I totally get why the, trying to use async doesn't make sense, because it is specialized to future. But I, I feel like they maybe had solved some of the sort of ownership problems there in terms of the inlining and different tree construction. Have you thought about kind of like trying to steal the guts of that and just figure out kind of what they're doing and use it? Ultimately, Jason Zog recently posted like an example of, again, doing like inlining fully correctly and maintaining ownership and doing all this stuff. Have you thought about like trying to steal that code or just like steal his brain or something like that? Because I feel like he he's the only person I know who's really gotten this sort of thing to work. Like we all write inlining macros that like mostly work and then very occasionally blow up. Um, but so, so yes, stealing his brain is is the most desirable possible thing to do. Um, but barring that, yes, you're right. Uh, so async actually has already gotten most of these things right in its ANF transformation. Um, so the thing is, an, AN, an ANF transformation isn't exactly the right thing for us right now. Um, so we can't just like wholesale steal his code. I think the more correct approach is to figure out what we need and do the same sorts of things. Um, and so that, that's sort of the direction. Mm -hmm.